Uh, there's like a different theme for every week. So like last week, um, the theme was came up from the group of, you know, so, t so many times we talk about like coping skills for how to deal with anger, how to get to know your anger, and that's done through a variety of art therapeutic methods, like mandalas and, um, you know, inside outside techniques. Um, but last week, uh, one of the young people were like, well, what about when you get angry at yourself? And I was like, oh, that's true. That's important. Mm -hmm. So we did like um, just an ex like a visual expression of how you get angry at yourself. And I put out materials, and young people come in. Sometimes young people are encouraged to go to Art and Anger um, because they are seen as people who have not a connected relationship to their anger. And other times people like to come in and talk about it and make art in, in the setting. And mm -hmm. um, so, that's so it sounds like it works a little bit both because uh, as you're doing things or you, people are talking about stuff yeah, yeah. and that helps too uh -huh. sometimes uh -huh. to be doing things and yeah. to help with the talking and um and also it's like it's interesting because a lot of people are like oh this person's an artist they should be in art therapy and sometimes that's like right on and other times they can't like get the artist's eye away from their right. their work. Um, <laughs> so you're not there critiquing them. No, no, <laughs> you're not there critiquing that's them. That's nice to get, before you said um, you wanted to win. And like, everyone that's a wins. situation where everyone, everyone wins. Everyone wins. <laughs> it really is, because you like express something, you discover something, you, and if you don't express something or you don't discover something, at the very least, you have the like therapeutic opportunity of exploring with art materials. Yeah. So there's really, no way we're not winning here yeah <laughs> um, so yeah and we and where i work has like dinner you know I, i'm i'm a youth worker and i'm an art therapist uh -huh. yeah i'm um, feel free to ask the details i just am like as a mm. yeah no i just find it i find it i guess we were talking before but i i feel like it's um there's a bravery in committing your life to trying to make things better yeah right and also and separating what like better means, and right? Separating what better means. Because like, yeah, yeah. Um, better looks a lot of different ways. Success to looks a lot, lot of different, different ways. ways. Different um, surviving trauma looks a lot of different ways. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a big part of it. But there's a lot of holding in there. Mm -hmm. So, and I, we had this talk back the other day, and one thing that happens often at the talk backs is. Um, people talk about the mother in the play um, uh, and frame it like in, in some ways that she's the antagonist even though people aren't necessarily sure um, it, uh, your allegiance does tend to switch at times but the talkbacks seem to kind of uh, always go there a little bit um, with the idea that she's seeking revenge which is not I don't think she is. I think she's seeking radical <laughs> healing. <laughs> right. But uh, and Methods. and Glenn, you said something at the end of the kind of at the end of the talkback that I, uh, regarding the end of the play, which we don't have to say what happens. No. But but um, I, I well, could you talk about that? Sure. Um, I think that like everyone has a different relationship in in watching mm -hmm. theater to to needing or wanting catharsis, right? Like I think that some people are able to be like, okay, like I was moved and I don't have a, a closed satisfied feeling or I was, um, and sometimes I think I'm the type of audience member who, who if, I, if I don't find it, I find it for myself, right? Like, cause I'm like, no, no, I wanna, I, like, I go more into the characters and whatnot. And I think also what is beautiful about these characters is yeah, you're, you know, um, I think the language used was like allegiances. Um, mm -hmm. They like, ch you know, for some people they change. They're like, wait a minute. It's very complex and rich. Um, but for me, I found a lot of catharsis in that someone made boundaries, that the, the mother character made a boundary. And that was my catharsis. Um, and when people are, it just, to me, it was very, obviously, I've, I've seen it in people I work with, I've seen it in people I love, that when you're part of, like, um, a family that has a lot of trauma and abuse in it, that, like, that a lot of times the only ways to stop those cycles is by creating a boundary. And that boundary is not, that can impact the, the unit, the family, in ways that, um, that are ugly or... 
are hurtful or the audience may judge. <laughs> um, the, but they, those boundaries, I think, are, are necessary for, for, for breaking cycles of abuse and trauma. So that's what I, yeah, I never for a minute was like, she's getting revenge or, you know. Right, right. yeah. But I, right. yeah, we kind of talked a little bit about too that um, some theater go goers who might be older um, might sympathize with the care of the father character and like, um, just like developmentally when we reach certain stages, we're thinking about that somewhere, subconsciously not. What is going to be my care? Who will make sure I'm treated with the respect um, when, when I get older, if I have medical issues, if I have cognitive issues? And I think it's something to explore. If you, I don't know. This is uh, off the, the therapist books, but I think if you live a life where you treat people like shit, you don't get to decide that they're going to treat you real good when you're old. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I mean, and, and that I think everyone deserves to be treated with respect, but if you want to make sure that happens... <laughs> you might want to treat people better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are some of my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, like going going back to, to just talking about Paige, um, uh, Taylor, you had mentioned at one point that there, there's this moment where she's she's staging this pub art therapeutic uh, moment of this, uh -huh. this this puppet show that um, in which at which point the play might turn into something else. Uh -huh. Like it's kind of straining against the boundaries of what the of what the play is, yeah. and I'm trying not to give anything away here, but but the play I, is I more or less useful. on a unit set with a real with a with a more or less it obeys the laws of verisimilitude more or less, yeah. and and then there's this one moment where it's straining against that. Um, I guess my question is like, what might the play become, and what is the what was your impetus? <laughs> Like you know, and what what are we putting in there? The prequel you know, to the I mean, I think, I think in a lot of ways it's uh, so for me the the play the is set in that family kitchen sink uh, drama um, because it it feels like it's wanting to break free of that. So the characters are trying to break free of that form of the nuclear family form and of the middle class America great American middle class form and they're 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 there's pressed up against the fourth wall it feels like throughout the whole play and two of the one of the characters particularly and I mean and probably two of them are like let's get out let look we could break the wall <coughs> we could go out into the house we could create performance art you know <laughs> and the and the other two characters uh, or at least one of the, the other main character is basically saying, no, 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 no. I'm not safe out there, you know. Um, I don't know how to, I don't know how I'm gonna take care of myself out there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to heal myself out there. Um, I know how to heal myself in here. So, uh, so there's that conflict that happens. Uh, and it's not like they're really talking about, not, they don't, it's not meta, they don't talk about um, the fourth wall. They're not talking about performance <laughs> yeah. art. They're not talking any of that stuff, but, um, it's just that the the sense of the form is being um, dictated by the content. Yeah. yeah. The father's like non-consensual performance art. Yeah. <laughs> the father's non-consensual performance art. Like it's <laughs> happening in the wall. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who knew? Yeah, I think a sequel might include like the father just kind of wanders out into the house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, I mean, there were ideas early on that the play would explode, that the house would burn down, that the that, um, that some crazy thing would happen in the house. There were gonna be, I was gonna have all these rats that were under people's seats. They were <laughs> certainly like, under, you know, underneath them, because they started to vibrate and then the, mechanically run around the space. And there was gonna be all this stuff that I had ideas about. And ultimately I just said, no, I think maybe it's better just to press them up against the glass. A shadow puppetry show is maybe. That's we see how way. fabulous it could be, uh. right? <laughs> we see how fabulous the, the, their lives could be. Like they, they actually are having a really good time putting on this shadow puppetry show. Yeah, like everyone's it's participating. The art brings people together. You know. Yeah. Um, well, the, I mean, the, the, that, that unit set American family realistic play 
has been kind of the dominant form for so long. Uh, I mean, since since yeah. since like the yeah the late nineteenth century into the twentieth century. Yeah. What is it? And you specifically use that mm -hmm. um, that as as a as a box to put the play in, and it's kind of pressing up against the edges. Mm -hmm. What does the form connote to you? What does it mean? Like, what is the what is the is there like a is there like a meaning of that that it, that it carries for you that you were that you that, that you chose to use it this way? Um, Does that question make sense? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, I think because primarily uh, men are produced in the American theater, um, it it takes the form of masculinity for me. Um, because primarily, not that men are masculine, but um, but uh, you see where I'm going with that. Yeah, and um, uh, I think it takes the what it means to me is uh, a champion, a championing of um, of middle brow culture um, and middle class culture, and uh, a champion of um, of things that are recognizable uh, and um, a certain amount of comfort. Uh, I, I just got in this. I almost got into a conversation about this earlier today with someone on, on, online, and I just, I just stopped myself. <laughs> so, don't do it, Taylor. Don't Boundaries. do it. Boundaries. Boundaries. <laughs> uh, and, and it was basically the um, that urban blight. I travel around a, a, the country a lot, as does Glenn, and and um, I, everywhere I go, I see that urban blight is taking over, taking over, taking over, and uh, that has a lot to do with the fact that we have been telling middle class stories and um, creating, uh, making sure that the middle class are seen and heard um, and uh, that they feel comfortable and safe and that they feel important. And we've been doing that in our culture for um, uh, uh, over 100 years now. And um, it feels like one of the casualties, there's some great things that have come from it, but <laughs> one of the casualties is urban blight um, and uh, a, a kind of homogenization of the culture. So uh, that's, um, so I, I respond to it that way. I mean, I have lots of different feelings. They're not all negative about it, but but yeah. So that I guess that's that's what the form means to me. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, even though I find it a moving uh, form, it, I mean, obviously it, it can be very useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is it? What kind of what's the form that your plays performances take, Glenn? <laughs> <laughs> um, the Shadow Puppet Show is yeah. what my performance yeah. mistake. Um, it's a form, I, I did study theater in undergrad and I found that there wasn't, um, there wasn't like a lot of space for who, uh, who I was in the form. <laughs> and uh, it was a huge, amazing awakening that I got as a, a like luckily got as a very young person um, that you can, not live in the form <laughs> and create your own work. Um, um, I think I name my form visual and theatrical daring. That's what I've named it. Visual and, and theatrical, theatrical daring. daring. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's like I feel like what I've named it. Um, but I found absurd realism to be inspirational. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I did. Absurd okay. realism being that. Uh, it, it's all a realistic circumstance, um, but it's just showcasing some of the absurdity in that circumstance, So, um, which is slightly different from theater of the ridiculous, I think. Um, uh, whereas theater of the ridiculous might take, um, you've gotta make change in for the meal, and or you, you have a meal and you pay for it, and, uh, and the check comes and you've got, eh, a, a moment where you're splitting the the, the bill, <laughs> and then you you kind of oh, you, oh well I paid this much this much this much and you're like okay da, 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 and it just goes on forever. It might go on for <laughs> like 30 minutes instead of instead of the right. usual minute that it would take. Um, absurd realism would just be the minute that it actually takes to do it, but um, but it would put that that beat and then the next beat would also be another crazy moment like uh, I always use the example of the blinds broke in the house 
uh, the sun comes in every single day, nobody's fixed the blinds for 10 years, but at a certain point, everyone in the house puts on sunglasses. <laughs> That is something that is, uh, has happened in my family. And that, uh, you know, that is absolutely absurd. So it creates an absurd image, but it's completely part of our, the reality of our lives. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, that was, so, but that's not what you're doing on that stage. No, you're no, no, I'm not, but I, I appreciate, I like was like, yeah, it's absurd realism. Like it worked, I saw. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was like, a, I think, a magnificent way to communicate that story. And what I'm doing is um, usually solo, but not always. And um, yeah, visual and theatrical daring is what I call it. Um, when I was younger, there was a lot less text because I didn't, um, it was a lot more movement, um, tap dancing, semantic sax. And then as I got older, I got a little less and less scared of uh, using text in my work, and so it's uh, come in more and more. Um, I struggle with linear, <laughs> uh -huh. um, but always start projects thinking, this is the one that's going to be linear, um, and then it doesn't always go that way. But we'll see, because it keeps being the one, you know? Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know one but why day. do you feel the need for there to be one? We were just, it was funny, because we were just talking about, um, you know, I was talking about what I was working on, and I, and I like very sheepishly, sheepishly was saying, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm working on a play about my mother, and I don't know why I said it so sheepishly, um, because everyone I t told was like, great, that's that's wonderful, mm -hmm. but I think as um, people who you know are put put in or identify with performance art. Um, that you know, we're, we're like, oh, I shouldn't be doing a play about my mother. Like it's too, like we're scared of the cliche, right? But like actually, it's beautiful, and I have to be like, I'm doing a play about my mother. Right. <laughs> like you know, um, and that we'll see how that looks. I mean, right now it's linear. So. Yeah, people would always <laughs> say to me, uh, well, I wrote this play years ago called yeah. The Young Ladies of, and people would always say, oh, it's your father play. Every playwright has to kill their father and their mother. Why do people you know? do that? And, and I was like, oh, I guess it's not valid now. Oh, it is valid. <laughs> it's so valid. Father. I but saw that play. But it's art therapy, right? <laughs> it's, it, it, I mean, drama therapy or art therapy. Or art therapy, whatever. Right? It, it's that thing that you do in order to heal. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes when you... And understand. You, yeah, to heal and to like, I think also to understand, because like when we, um, if we're lucky to grow up in families that feel relatively safe and take care of us, um, it's like weird, you're just put there you, these, with these people who are processing their own trauma and hopefully not putting it on you, but probably a little. And, um, and it is, you know, when you're, in your, when you're growing up, you're just, you're just there and you're part of it. But you do, it takes a lifetime to process that shit. Oh wait, are you not supposed to curse at symposium? Uh, no, you're, uh, you're fine. I think you can <laughs> curse whatever you want. Uh, Thanks, thanks. I love. It. I think I work with young people. I can't ever curse, and I love to curse. Yes. What? Really? Well, because you have to. Set an I say example? that we can curse in art and anger, but only in that group, because really? sometimes it's very satisfying, and you can't curse at anyone. You can just curse about things. Yeah. But I think like the rules of the, you know, we're all just trying to make a lot of different safer spaces. So what do you think about this safe space thing? No, I said, did you hear me? I said safer. <laughs> safer. Okay. I said, safe space, it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're in concentrated areas with, with people who have um, experienced and are processing a lot of trauma currently or crisis, I think it's a good A for effort to make it safer. Yeah, and that yeah, can yeah, include yeah. like yeah. not using certain language and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but yeah. that's my... I mean, you always want people to listen. I always find that with the place. It's like, okay, maybe I want to say something, but if I actually say that at this moment in the play, everyone's going to stop listening. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll hold <laughs> off until, you know, they're about to leave before I say it. <laughs> well, you know, I just think like a lot like existing in the world is a risk. And when we go see art, we're taking a risk and it's usually a magnificent one. But I am also fully open to like the risk of being offended. Yeah. You know, sure. like I because I trust myself that I can handle that. If you can't handle it, then maybe then know maybe you that shouldn't. you go to an art that has you know, uh, assurance of certain things. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, that's right. <laughs> and that's what people, uh, somebody said I sh for here that I should have a trigger alert. 
a trigger alert. Play. Yeah, they said I should have a trigger alert. And my, I mean, my my kind of I, I'm like I work in catharsis. It's it's it. Someone says it's a play. You should know trigger alert already. It's I work. Yeah. My job is catharsis. I'm like I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I mean, I, I realize not everybody understands the rules of theater, but um, yeah. But it's it, something is supposed to happen to you. Something's supposed to happen to you in that room. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I always talk about the yes and right. So it's like right. yes, something's supposed to happen to you, and if you are feeling. Like, you can always ask, right? right? Like, if I called the box office and said, hey, I'm really excited about this play because it's called an alternative pronoun or whatever reason I'm excited right. about the play, uh, can I know some more about the content or something right. like that? Like, so instead of, I think there can be a balance where we teach advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, um, you know, make everything so I can handle it. Because yeah. that's not real. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's not real. Like when I get on the subway every morning, do I know I can handle it? Absolutely not. <laughs> like, like, but you know. <laughs> so. But that doesn't mean the subway should be full of people who have a, a, a social etiquette that is no, because uh, that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh no, the social but, etiquette. No, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. It would be yeah. great if that wasn't the case. <laughs> <laughs> do we have yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What would, what did they want the trigger alert for? Um, I th I think for uh, this person wasn't a returning vet, but they wanted it for returning vets. They oh, okay. were sensitive about returning vets, um, mm -hmm. and I don't think this person knew a returning vet, but um, they were sensitive about them. You know? So right. you know, I hear that a little bit, but I um, I also I. I I, you know, it's yes and. I'm. I, right. I hear it. I absolutely hear it. And I think it's fucking bullshit. And yes, you and. know, it's like, yes and. I I hear it and I absolutely believe it. And I want to take care of somebody who's going to be in the audience and be be traumatized by something <clears throat> that might happen. And I also want to make sure that we're not using hyperbole when we talk about trauma, and that when someone says they're traumatized, that it, it actually means that they are and that they're not just uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's not for me necessarily to define what what you are, but I but I also have seen trauma in my life, and usually it consists of a person not being able to tell you that they're traumatized. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's that's real. And also, like when you said that person who was saying they wanted a trigger warning for you know vets or whatnot, um, you know, I just. Lost my thought, but I'm sure it was brilliant. And, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they also are like, you know, a lot of times you'll hear in like therapy speak, tra they'll say trauma with a little T or trauma with a big T. Oh, yeah. But I think there's all different size T's yeah, in between. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm down with that, yes, and. Yes, and. Because I mean, I, I also think that like, there's something I say a lot in, in facilitation or groups or, or anything is that, oftentimes like more information creates safer spaces. Um, but like we like we can invite that information, we don't tell that information. And also we also a lot of times people make the assumption that like if I was uh, if one is a child that um, witnessed a lot of um, abuse or violence, that seeing that mirrored um, is inherently like a bad experience. And sometimes it's a really validating experience <laughs> to hear other stories or uh -huh. see it. You know, so I think that just this assumption that like people react the same way to trauma, like, uh, or to, to needing a trigger warming, right. warning, like that, it's just not, um, it, it's not always that cut and narrow. No. Yeah. I mean, an ice cream could trigger you. Right. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, it, <laughs> doesn't always have to be, it doesn't always have to be the theme. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be the direct theme. It could be yes. any number of things could. So, yeah. I mean, I, uh, yeah. Bring out the ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I'm like, uh, my food. I forgot all about my I food. Um, <laughs> I want to op I wanna, um, open this up to questions from, from you guys um, in just a minute. Because <laughs> um, I want to be like, as one sort of question that I, that I, the last question that I sort of wanted to ask you guys. Um, uh, especially as as um, to performers who who are coming, you know, this, Taylor. Taylor, this is your first show, I believe, like in the on Forty Second Street. You know, I guess I, I guess my question, yeah, you know, my question my question is, if you were to change one thing, or if you found one thing the most frustrating about the 
theater world, or what, or if you there's a thing that you wish that the theater, that the theater community could do better than it does, what would you say is the most? Uh, and I've read some of your some of some of your some of your um, writings about this, but I wonder if there's one thing that sort of just jumps to mind. Uh, and I, think, I guess this question's for both of you. Like, what do you kind of wish plays and theater, the theater community would do a little bit better than it does? I think there's two things. This is interesting. Wait. There's two things I, I, I feel. Um, there's so many things. Uh, <laughs> I... It's interesting. So our world that we come from doesn't have, it has a certain kind of rigor, <clears throat> but it is not the, the standardized rigor. It's not the standardized understanding of rigor. Um, there's a certain craft to it, and the craft comes with growing up outside of the culture for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and, and having to develop your own craft in order to survive and tell your story and feel empowered, right? So that kind of craft is really unique to, um, uh, 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 for lack of a better way of saying it, the downtown aesthetic, right? And the downtown world and the downtown way of making things and, and certainly queer performance. Um, what they don't have a lot of because they haven't <coughs> always been invited into the uh, into the institutions, learning facilities, and mentorships, and all of those types of things is they don't have a lot of the standard craft, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, casting Max, uh, if I'll just be a little honest, was um, was a, a hard. Um, I mean, when we found Tom, then it was easy. But uh, it was hard because this play was asking for a certain amount of method acting that uh, the transgender community uh, that is in, living in New York and working ha hasn't had uh, access to. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what they have had access to was they all got to play Peter Pan in you know <laughs> elementary school. No, I mean seriously. So there was that. There's like this kind of wonderful presentational, my personality is forward. My, so they were all coming in and I was falling in love with every single person that came in and Nigel was too and we were both going, uh, first off I hate that we were having auditions but, but I also loved that I was meeting all these people and, um, and you know, at some point Nigel turned to me and said, we should make something with all these actors. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and I thought, yeah, because you have to write something very specific for them. Um, because they have a different craft. And so uh, I guess um, that's something that I, I would like to see a little bit of the barriers being uh, letting go. I think that that's going to happen as um, <coughs> transgender people get more power in the world and, uh, and queer people become less marginalized. But I, uh, but I still think there's such a, um, a solid wall. I was at a, a talk years ago and um, an artistic director in town, who will go nameless, <laughs> said, uh, who I love, but will go nameless, said, uh, you know, we've got to create standards. We have to create these industry standards. And I thought, whose standards? <laughs> you know, whose standards are you talking about? Are you talking about, you know, these three people over here and then all these other people are left to try to mimic what you want to do? You know, so it's, it was a really weird thing to hear in an in, uh, environment of art, you know. Um, so that's something I feel like the theater community, theater community, the established theater uptown community could learn from downtown is that the standards are actually um, dragging you down into the quagmire of middle class, <laughs> right? Um, so that's one thing. Um, uh, the, I mean, I guess uh, the other thing is, um, that I wish that our world, our downtown world, had more rigor in it. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, I wish that people didn't feel like they had to um, protect, you know, build themselves so much in order to protect themselves and find their place in the world and could actually uh, engage in uh, a different kind of rigor. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that the solution, right, is like, I mean, if we're looking for a solution, we might not be like, uh, but just um, when I think about myself and when I like, you know, 
to, to use an I statement, when I graduated from theater school, um, it was time to become a performer versus an actor. Because if I invested my time and money into to continuing training as an actor, uh, there was nothing to audition for. So it was like, like why? Like, what would, why would I do that? Right. <laughs> you know, that's a, to me a common sense thing. <laughs> Right. So, you know, while I, you know, while it's great to have the opportunity to play personified flowers, I definitely um, I would love to be a human being ever so often. <laughs> One day, we'll see. Um, you know, and then and and wonder what it would look like to go through the training of, of, of doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know that was uh, ambushing you with a big question. No, I mean, the, and we could talk about it for hours because yeah. I got some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there, there was a hand that, your hand shot up the second I said questions from the audience. And uh, we, uh, we'd like to, uh, we're actually taping the, this. Um, uh, so we'd love to, for you to um, ask a question through the mic. And being a nonprofit theater, we only have one mic. So um, I'm going to have uh, Dylan here run the mic to you. Is this right? Uh, I have a question for Mr. Mack, but first I would like to say that in my book club, if someone comes who has not finished the book, there's an implicit understanding that there will be spoilers given. And it just seems to me that if you have a, a symposium about a play, there should be an implicit understanding that you know, there are going to be details discussed and there could be spoilers. Now my question, uh, given that, uh, based on one thing, uh, Taylor, that you said about the play, and I've seen it, and you wrote it, so you know the answer. But I can't understand how you could say that Paige, the mother, is not um, definitely seeking revenge on the father now that she's in a position to do so. Mm. Well, I think that um, history often uh, trumps uh, what is actually happening on a stage. So your understanding of uh, family and history and abuse and, uh, and revenge um, and, uh, uh, that, and, and how that is shaped through uh, centuries and centuries of, of drama on a stage, that ha um, sometimes uh, is very distracting and very hard to hear what's actually being said. So Paige, she, she talks about wanting to take Isaac to a new world, wanting to be done with this old world. Yes, that's true. But she's constantly talking about, look at this new world we're making. Look at this fabulous thing we've got. Look at this wonderful thing. Look at this. And she is inviting Isaac. And really, <coughs> really, time and time and time again, her dialogue is, <coughs> come with us, come with us, come with us. Look how fabulous it is. We don't have to do this anymore. We don't have to be abused anymore. We don't have to do, feel any of these things anymore. Come with us, come with us. And, um, and then at the end of the play, people still feel like what she was saying was, uh, don't come with us. Fuck that man. Uh, I'm gonna kill him. I hate him. This is, this is all to punish him. And, and she never really, she mentions the father a couple times in the entire play. She is so intent on um, breaking free of that, I think. So it's interesting to me. It's, not, it's certainly not a fault. Uh, it's certainly not, it's not a fault of the writer, and it's not a fault of the audience that we, that, that happens. But I think, it's, uh, I think it's about history and the way stories are told and have been told, um, that they can, they can often be very uh, distracting. Um, so my job as a, as a playwright is to go, OK, do I write it this way to help break that history, um, that assumption, um, or do I just write this and then hope that uh, uh, it, it sneaks in? And you know, I always go back and forth on what to do, but I, I, I feel like I've done enough for this play at this time. Yeah, I hope that helps anyways. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. 
so earlier there was a brief conversation about trigger warnings. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hearing what you're saying about not wanting to um, censor your own experience. Um, but then I also hear what Glenn has to say about offering more information. And I'm wondering what the counter argument is to that. Oh, well, offering more information. Um, or encouraging that people get more information. Encouraging people get more information. Encouraging that people take responsibility for their experience. Their risk taking. Their risk taking for the day, you know. Mm -hmm. um, just in the same way that you would if you were coming here to uh, 42nd Street and you didn't know where it was exactly, you might go online and look up where is this place? How's the best way to get there? How am I going to be the least trauma, traumatized in getting there? <laughs> you know, so I think, I think that that is if you want if you want to do the digging. I think that we uh, institutions, artists, people who are doing it should be able to uh, give you the information that you can do the digging. But I don't think we should make that information uh, easily available in terms of. Uh, you just go to the website and there it is. I think you should have to Google it. You should have to look for it. You should have to say, you should have to call up the theater and ask, you know, like, look, these are my, these are the things that I don't want to see right now. Is, does this play contain any of that? You know, those kind of things, because if we give you the information, then that stops other people uh, from being able to uh, um, decide whether or not it's uh, triggering because a lot of people might not find this play triggering at all. And if they walk into the space, what we're trying to do in the first five minutes is get the audience to laugh. We're trying to give them permission to laugh because it's a heavy play and, and we, want them, we want them in it. We want them to express the full range of their humanity in the room with us and because there are lots of different forms of catharsis. And so we're trying to get the audience to laugh. And if we say, trigger alert, this, is go this could possibly be traumatizing for some people, then they come in there and they're like, no one's going to laugh no matter what we do. If we put that clown center stage and that curtain part, <laughs> they still are not going to laugh. You know? um, so I, so we, have to, we have to work it. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, Ibsen didn't give like a trigger alert to say, hey, you might get upset. Right. Like, I think all the great works of art, really, I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them, like, are things that, that upset people in their, when, they were, when they first came about. And so I think it's easy for us to forget that. But you seem like you might have something you want to say about that. No, I mean, I think it's a yes, you know, it's very it's much a, a yes, yes and, and, because I also... I can say, like, I am super um, jazzed when someone puts on their postcard, like, details about, you know, this theater's up a flight of stairs or that, you know, different things. Like, I think that's awesome, right? Um, um, I, you know, so, like, yes, I want to live in a world that provides that information. Um, and I think that the other side of that is, I don't know, I can't, I mean, I personally can't imagine a world, because I haven't lived in one, where, especially in uptown theaters, I can fit my ass in comfortably to the seats, right? So I've, but I want to go to the theater. So I learned, you know, to either, my options are don't go to the theater, or figure out how to sit at the theater, right? I'm, I'm just trying to sit here and imagine to myself, what would it be like if it told me my options? I don't know, maybe that'd be fab, you know? But I've just yeah. never lived in that world, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. And I think it's, it, accessibility is different than content, but for some people it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that I would encourage people to, um, if they felt that it like added to their theatrical experience and aligned with their politics, create spaces that offer um, all of the information. And, um, if not, then know that people who have a hard time existing in the world might not come to the show. Yeah. We get to decide. It's also that thing <laughs> of, I mean, I find it, what's interesting is that it's it certainly the audience is much more uh, Playwrights Horizons audience than my audience that usually comes to my work. Um, and that 100% ha has to do with, uh, uh, I wouldn't say 100%, but primarily about ticket price, you know. Um, and, um, 
And it doesn't matter if you're like, but you could get it for this price. You could get it this this discount, this discount, this discount, you know. And actually, it's actually, ultimately, it would be cheaper than going to see me at Joe's Pub. Because you have to buy the ticket and the two drink minimum. So you know you're going to, but psychologically, they, they it shuts them down. And so I, so I, I, um... I'm I'm always calling them on their bullshit when they're like, you that that Lincoln Center concert was you know eighty dollars. I'm like, we just did two free Lincoln Center concerts. Shut up, like it's okay, you know. But they you know, people are always mad at me, and um, <laughs> the queers the queers are always mad. <laughs> they're always mad as they should be. I'm so happy they're mad all the time. Uh, <laughs> And then, yes, right. So, uh, but what I find interesting about the, um, is that it's content, what did you say? Content is sometimes different from access, but not often. And so people even, they feel like they don't have access, and so then they shut down to the content. And, and I, I think, think that's, that's for forgiving, right? Like, I, if people have to, absolutely. you know, like, um, you know, so often in theater, they'll be like, why aren't these type of people here? Why are the only people here in this demographic? Maybe it's like, you know, maybe the risk of participating is too much. Right. And, um, you know, and that, to me, that makes sense with like a variety of different marginalized identities. Um, it's exhausting oppression, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> and you know, you don't necessarily want to go to the theater to, um, to not know what bathroom you're going to have to use. Right. right. Like, you, I mean, it's so much easier to just stay home and use your own. And first, you know, and sometimes that, that's the case. And sometimes it's not the case. And like, I think alongside encouraging um, people to, you know, I think the encouragement of trigger warnings is one thing, but like, why can't uh, the encouragement of like advocacy be another? Like, because how many times does it take for someone to call and say, "Do you have a gender neutral bathroom?" So maybe one day they'll make a gender neutral bathroom. Right. Who knows? You know. Right. Um, so, again, with the yes and. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Um, question back there, and then I'll come back to you. Next. Taylor Mack, hi. hi. Um, I, have, I, I think an unsophisticated viewer of the play might say, this guy so messed up his daughter that she hates men, doesn't want to be a woman, doesn't even want to have a gender. Uh -huh. And But I think the way you intended it is probably more, this is a character who happens to be transgender and has this father, does that fit? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and so then my, my bigger question is, I mean, this is clearly a real male patriarchal kind of abusive father. What do you think would be the nuances of what that does to the head of a, a transgender person? Um, and, and we sort of saw what it did to the, the, the veteran brother and stuff. It, it just turned him really <coughs> macho and he went in that direction and how, you know, what, any thoughts about it? I, I asked this already, just go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I, first off, I would say it's probably different for every single transgender person uh, who's under that circumstance. Right? <laughs> so um, I, I don't know what it, I, I can't speak uh, for all of them or any of them, really. So I, I, I know that for me as a queer, uh, kid and uh, you know borderline gender queer. Um, I uh, uh, I think that it it made me retreat into myself more and my studies, my own personal studies and my imagination more. I think um, so, and and uh, and it made me seek out people who. Um, were like me more. So that's, I could say that for me. Um, I think for Max, I have made decisions for Max and I think that's true of Max as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I think there was a lot of like, um, I, I too have a complex relationship to masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was something about that that was like really acknowledged in the play that was really nice to see. Um, just, 
it wasn't like, you know, the driving point necessarily, but that, um, I mean, even less, having nothing to do with the uh, representation of abusive father masculinity in the house, I think that like, particularly around transition and identifying as transgender, um, there's, there's still a lot of rules out there of how to be a man and how to be a woman. Mm. And so I think that that's stressful already. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, for not just transgender people, but for all people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. Question right here. <laughs> <laughs> It's the long microphone pass. <laughs> uh, I was very intrigued with what you said, uh, Mr. Mack, about the, the uh, theatrical institutions uptown maybe sh becoming a little looser and performers downtown having a little more rigor. I, I think Are there it's specific things actually. from your yeah, from your experience here? Well, I see that in my theater going, but in your from your experience just here with you know with this current uh -huh. play, have you do you have you do you have specific ideas about how more that can be done to bring that about? Um, I mean, I think, I think they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, they brought me and they brought booty candy and they brought, you know what I mean? They brought Iowa. I mean, I think they're doing a really good job at that here actually. Um, they have two proscenium stages, so there's only so much they can do, <laughs> you know? I mean, you know what I mean? It's always going to kind of, kind of be within the realm of a uh, uh, fourth wall audience there, performer here, never the twain shall meet, uh, except for, you know, ever so often. <coughs> and because that's, because that's the circumstance of, their, of the building. And, um, but, I, but I think they're, they're really, I think, I mean, it's why I wrote this play for this theater and it's why I wanted to work here uh, above all the other theaters in town is because I do feel like they are the closest to uh, bridging that divide of any other theater in, in town. So I, I really respect that about what they're doing here. And, yeah. if, I, if I go like that, would you answer the question the same? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, to be fair, I, I, I don't want to exclude other people. I think the public is also doing a really good job with that. The Gob Squad right now is, is a performance art piece that is on their main stage. They have their Under the Radar Festival. They're, you know, I mean, I, I feel, I, when I was acting in a play there, uh, it was Fun Home downstairs. Uh, uh, I was in a Breck play upstairs. Wally Shawn was doing his play downstairs. Uh, the Apple family was, you know, so all these very different works were all happening at the same time. So, I, and Joe's Pub is there. So, I mean, I do think that people are, are bridging the gap, but in terms of theaters that are above 14th Street, I think this is the one. That's my. Um, if I remember uh, the lines correctly, I think you have, toward the end of the play, Paige comments that if only eyes, if I had gone to the, to the museum, that things might have ended differently. Do you think as the playwright that that is true? That that was a tragic mistake? That they could have... I think it's true for ending? Paige. Okay. I think that... I think... I think she believes wholeheartedly in what is going to save hmm. her and her family. Uh, and part of her tragedy is that she can't see that someone isn't necessarily like her and doesn't need the same thing sh she needs in order to heal. Um, and, uh, um, and part of Isaac's tragedy is the same thing actually, that he cannot see that actually that things are better. Just because the house is a disaster doesn't mean it's not better. That actually is so much better. Um, and that postmodern isn't necessarily worse. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I say there used to be a line in the play where she says, look, the house is a disaster and there's holes all over everything and everything's broken up. And she said to Isaac, look, Isaac, we're postmodern. You know? <laughs> But I cut it for <laughs>
Um, um, continuing the conversation of uh, art as therapy, uh -huh. is there something that you, Taylor, come, you have come away with after this experience of writing this play? Um, well, I always say, you probably heard me say this on stage <laughs> before, but I always say, why should I, you know, why should I pay a therapist when I can have people pay me to do my therapy? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I don't, it's not clearly we've learned it's not art therapy, but it uh, and it's not even really drama therapy. But it's um, but yes, I mean I I do I, I'm a little you know tongue in cheek when I say that, but I think it's also true that I'm I, when I write a play I say what about me don't I want the audience to know and then I say okay that's what the play is going to be about, um, and then the other thing I often do will do is say what am I ignoring. Um, in my life and in the society and the culture around me, um, what am I ignoring? And then I try to make the play about that. So uh, that's certainly what I use both of those techniques for here. I, I, don't, I won't tell you more about it, <laughs> let you come see it, but I, I, in hopes that uh, if I expose something that I don't want the audience to know about me, I'm, I'm most likely going to connect to at least a few people in the audience that are also experiencing something like that and um, or that can apply it as a metaphor to their lives mm -hmm. and if I uh, focus on something that I'm ignoring then most likely uh, the people that live in my neighborhood or in my community or in my city or are, are experiencing something similar they're also maybe ignoring that thing so that's my hope anyway there's just a way like to it's a very like uh, clear demonstration of um, us all acknowledging as people that it's super hard to cope with those aspects of ourselves and our communities and worlds and um, you it we call it uh, sublimation right like you figured out a way to you know explore those um, it, it helps you live better in the world right mm -hmm. and I think that it's amazing when art can come from that and art can do that for you and then turn do something for an audience. Everyone wins. Everyone wins. <laughs> Everyone wins. Yeah, I mean, the bit, I, I told this story the other day, too, but I, I think it's worth it. This woman at the end of the show, she came up to me, and she was in her 80s, and it was second preview, and she said to me, um, so there's no hope? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I said something snarky back to her because I was in that vulnerable second preview place where I said, well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and, uh, but afterwards, I thought, I wish I had been uh, with it enough to say, uh, well, clearly there is hope because you are inspired enough to fight me on the idea that there might not be hope. <laughs> clearly the play has done its job. It has inspired you to want to find hope. Well, you know. That's what, I mean, one of the things that I say um, in Art and Anger, like, my work comes from a strength-based approach, right? So when, when I think about anger, and this is kind of connects to that story, is that if we didn't care, we wouldn't get angry. You know, mm -hmm. like, it's an inherent sense of value when mm -hmm. we get angry, mm -hmm. or we have a, mm -hmm. you know, reaction that mm -hmm. creates that art. So, yeah, the hope. Strength-based. <laughs> Strength-based! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Yeah. Well, somebody left the other day. She, they put in the progress reports or the, the stage management reports. They always say, overheard. You know? Ooh, that's... <laughs> and so I read them all the time. Cause I'm like, and sometimes they're, they're very nice things like, wonderful. Oh, those actors are so good. Oh, what a great experience. We're so happy we came. But then they also put the ones in that are like, some woman left and she was off. Well, some people like that. Oh my god, why would they do that? <laughs> I love it. Oh my god. Some people like that. Some people like that. Um, she took uh, a risk. She took a risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I wanted to say thank you all so much for, for, for joining us today, and thanks to Taylor and to Glenn thank for you. joining us. Um, I, this, this, this plywood that we're standing on right now, actually in three weeks' time, will be a set for our next show. Um, Marjorie Prime, um, so I hope you'll join us for that. And um, thank you all so much for spending your night with us.
I gotta get my jacket. It's cold, yeah.